Welcome, guys. This is Invest Iowa, where we talk about mindset, improvement, real estate, investors, all that type of stuff here in the Midwest. Today, we have the opportunity to interview and just get to know a little more Darson Grantham. So, thanks for coming, man. I yeah. appreciate you accepting this first podcast of this um, entire idea that I've been trying to grow for the last year and a half or so. And... I know that you have a lot to offer in terms of knowledge for people that are starting in the investing area just like me. My pleasure. It's very flattering. I'll try to hold my hold my ground. Yeah. So, without further ado, let's let's get right into the questions. So, I want to start with background questions like how, when, where, why. So, how do you become a real estate agent? How did I become a real estate agent yeah. is the general question. So I'll take a little step back. In high school, I owned a mowing company, right? So I've, I've had an entrepreneurial kick of some capacity my entire life. Um, that's, I never had a, a real W-2 paying job. And I, I had a couple, but it was like working for my uncle's garbage business. And other than that, I mowed yards, right? So I've done that, went into business college, and then went and got a W-2 job. When I went into college, it was a business college, and basically the, the jobs were banking or finance. No one talked about being able to just own your own business as a, as a profession, right? So I didn't really think about that being my main source of income. But I owned a mosquito spraying business. I owned an employee, uh, a bubble ball, um, bubble soccer. So I own 32 of those. I, never, I didn't know that. I never rent them out anymore because it's too much liability and just a pain in the butt. But yeah, so I own a bunch of those. So I've done things alongside of all my W-2 jobs. Uh, my W-2 job was selling employee benefits to business owners across the state of Iowa. And when I was laid off and let go on that from that job in 2017, that's when I like got the real estate kick uh, because I never wanted to rely on one person being my paycheck or one company being my paycheck, right? I wasn't ready to just go off and do my own thing. I didn't know what I wanted to do at that point, but I knew that I didn't want to rely on one person or one company. And so like basically I got another W2 job and started buying and investing in rental real estate. That was becoming an investor. And now your question is how do I become a real estate agent? Well, yeah. as an, as an investor, I bought seven properties without an agent. And it wasn't, wasn't that hard, but it wasn't super easy. I probably lost out on other deals that I probably would have been able to keep together if I had an agent, but I was fine with that because I was learning and I didn't feel like there was a ton of risk in going without an agent because I was willing to lose every one of the deals I had under contract. And so, um, basically went through seven transactions without an agent. And then when I lost my W2 job in 2020, my mind was, bye. I know what it's like to do agent work. It can't be that hard to sell two houses a month, which would replace my W-2 income. And so let me just talk to a lot of people about real estate and see if I can talk them into letting me help them buy or sell their house. So you became an investor before you were even considering to become a real estate agent. Yeah. I, I've never, I never before, before I was an investor, before I became an agent, I never had good experiences with real estate agents. Before, yeah, like I was an investor and every agent that I called to talk about real estate investing, they couldn't keep up with what I knew about investing. And it wasn't because I was that smart. I just studied it a lot because most agents don't really deal with investors day to day. Like I say deal with, work with them because an investor's mindset is way different than in a residential home purchaser's mindset. Right. I have not seen another investor that is heavily on especially like YouTube and, and like social media as you are. There are, just not in Des Moines. That's, that's what I meant because I, I'm, I'm thinking my scope is Midwest, yeah. like people around this area and, and like what you see. For example, I haven't seen a single channel of this source like trying to teach young people how to start. Correct. I just don't see it that much. It's, it's always about the W2 job. It's always about the all the mindset of, Get a job, get a loan so you can buy a car and get all those things so you can then buy a house. But then 
now you have no income because all your income is going to pay for other things and then your debt to income ratio yep. is so low yeah <laughs> well that like that's like it just there is it's an unknown of like is it des moines specific that you're trying to talk to right is it people that are in des moines in general or can the concepts that you talk about go to kansas city go to omaha go to you know tampa bay florida right like it probably could but there isn't there isn't as big a population as just looking at des moines right well i look at it as as an agent if i write if i do content on youtube or you do content on youtube right and you're educating people about des moines with a with a basically hyphenated des moines and just investing in general or mindset in general then they'll come to you or come listen to the channel for the mindset. And then they're like, they're like, Oh, Des Moines is a good place to invest. I like Des Moines or vice versa. I come to Des Moines. I come to this podcast to listen about what is it like to invest here. And then I'm like, Oh, my mindset has changed because these options are here. And that's what your channel is talking about or whatever. So talking about that investor side of things, how do you, how do you go about your first deal? Like how did that come across? You still, you were still had deal. your W2 job, right? Yes. So it depends on what you consider first deal. So right out of college or actually my last semester of college, I actually went and bought a house in 2010. It was when like I look back and I looked at every house I looked at was foreclosed or going under sh going in short sale. Where um, was that? Here in Des Moines. Here in Des Moines. Yeah. So we were renting a house, me and three other friends were renting a house in West Des Moines going to AIB college, business college, right? And one of them wanted to move out, and but we had another friend that was going to move in. And I was like, well, what if I just went and bought a house and everyone paid me rent? Like, that seems like a pretty logical, like, legit thing to do if I have a W-2. Well, I had a W-2 because I was doing full-time full -time work and full-time school for six months uh, that last year. And so I ended up getting a loan, buying a house, totally overpaying for it, looking back now. But because I house hacked and everyone was paying 500 bucks a room, then I was like, well, I, I paid my mortgage through, you know, people paying Still my profitable. Rent. Yeah, <laughs> so it was fine. Um, looking back though, what I was getting paid, I, as a W-2, I should never have bought that house to be real candid. I, I couldn't have technically afford it. So that was my first deal. That was through an agent. I, do, I mean, I don't remember anything about the transaction. It was super simple, basically, had the down payment it was when the tax credit was going on so i actually had the down payment i actually didn't have to bring anything to closing um do you feel like agents have changed in the way that they reach out to people or the efficiency at which they work with people yes yeah, i mean over time you have technology and you have you know automations and processes set up which is great some agents use them really well and some agents are straight I'm going to call you every time I want to talk to you, right? Like I grew my mosquito business. I didn't talk to one person on the phone. It was through text. Every single conversation that I had was through text. It was a requirement that I had to grow the business because I had a W-2 job at the same time. So I was like, if I have a W-2 job and I'm working in an office, I can't take phone calls all the time. I will only text. And basically everyone knew I would only text. And so if you wanted a phone call, I wouldn't answer it and you wouldn't use me as a mosquito sprayer. So like that's an example in a different industry. There are agents that are, I don't want to say exactly that same way, but pretty darn similar. Like they won't text much or they won't call much. It's only one form of communication. So. And would you say that that's the older generation? Yeah, your older generation is going to primarily call. Which some people still prefer that yep. Yep. face to face yep. interaction, right? Yep. I, I, like another kind of kind of topic on that communication for agents is the negotiating part of getting a deal, right? So your buyer agent talking to a listing agent and you're trying to negotiate with that listing agent. You negotiate with a phone call. Do you, do you negotiate during email or text, right? What's the right way to do it? The best way to do it is to take a call, right? If you're a skilled negotiator, taking a phone call and getting the other person on the phone is the best way to do it. But like most agents won't take, won't, won't do it that way. It's mostly during text. Do you take phone calls? I will take phone calls. Yeah. Cause I'm, I'm, I feel pretty confident in my negotiating skills, but on the flip side of that, like, I negotiate a lot during text also. And I think that our generation who has, you know, dated via text has got jobs via text, like communicates primarily via texting. That's true. Like we are really good at negotiating via text, even though it seems like, well, it seems like your negotiating skills are better on the phone. Yeah. 
Okay, so now touching back on that negotiation skills, how do you promote yourself? I'm actually not. As an agent, of yeah, course. Yeah, I'm actually probably not. I can be much better at this. I do think that I am, and not to feel like, not to pump my ego, I feel like I'm a better agent than most out there. Just my awareness of what the mar- what's going on in the market, how to make sure someone's not paying for paying too much for a property or listing a property in an incorrect way that's not going to get them, you know, a lower price in the end, like over over listing a property just to make the buyer client or the seller client happy. Like there's a lot of agents that'll do that. I have done it. I try really hard not to, or at least be really upfront with the folks that are not. But all that being said, how do I promote? I try to be just known as a investor, real estate agent and a real estate agent in general and having a lot of conversations with in circles that are looking to buy or transaction or transact in real estate. So what that means is like, I'm not going to the mall and going to talk to people about real estate because yeah, they might own houses, but that's not the place that they want to talk about real estate, right. right? Facebook group that is investor centric or a Facebook group that is a neighborhood centric They they have real estate questions and I watch those questions and I comment on them. I talk to people about that stuff. Um, any of my friends post on Facebook and they say something about the real estate industry, I'm going to comment on it. I'm going to give my two cents. Bigger Pockets is a website. Bigger Pockets conversations or uh, their topics, if they have to do with Des Moines, I'm going to comment on them. I'm going to put myself as the expert in the in that conversation. Um, that's, I mean, honestly, the main ways I promote YouTube channel, YouTube channel and Facebook. Bigger you, f- pockets. you feel it's working? It's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, when you say working, like I struggle with what working means to every single person, right? Because if I would love to have more, I don't, I have yet to f- develop the systems in place to do more promotion. I would, if I had someone that could do it and understood what I wanted and I could articulate to that person that I, what I wanted, I would do more promotion. I would create more podcasts, more YouTube videos, more mail, like mailers, I think are a huge, uh, like a huge play that most people are not taking advantage of, of as real estate agents and investors, um, not doing it well. Um, but if I did that and I had more leads coming in, I don't feel confident in my ability to service those leads as they come in just with the rest that I have going on in my table. So yeah. How do you get going networking? Talk to a lot of people. Just go talk to people. No. Yeah. Like you see send that done. No, it's not. Go find groups of people. Go to meetup.com and go look at groups. Anything, any groups, jazz groups, art groups, put yourself in front of other people and they're inevitably going to ask you about what do you do for a living? They're going to say, I'm a real estate agent. I do this, this, and this for my clients. They're going to say, well, how's the market? And that's your chance. That's what took you two years to quit your W2 job. Networking. Like that's, that's your strategy. Let me rephrase this. So it doesn't seem as confusing. You're telling me that you sat with everyone you knew for two years straight. How long have you been a realtor? Uh, 2020. 2020. Two years. So you're telling me that in two years you've come along all this time to have more than 100 videos yeah. and uh, what, a mail list of 1,000 plus? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's you, it's not more than... 700 days is it no yeah it's like no more than 800 days yeah but so okay so take a step back i've networked my entire adult life so like when i was an insurance agent in 2008 when i started i started networking groups so i've been talking to people not necessarily about real estate but talking to people in general since 2008 local to des moines and so like when you flip the switches now you're a realtor like you can re-engage those conversations Right. And, and they see you on Facebook because they followed you in 2008. That's what Facebook was going on. And so then they see, oh, you're, you know, you're now a real estate agent and you like, you can have, I can have that conversation with someone that I talked to in 2010 at a coffee meetup about whatever new business was in town. The young professional network, YPN, Y, yeah, YPN, which I mean, so I, I've networked 
my entire time in Des Moines. When I started investing in 2018, before I was an agent, before I knew that being an agent was what I wanted to do, I sat down with every single investor that would have coffee with me. I asked them to coffee like I was date, like I wanted to go on dates with people. <laughs> you did that to me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> did I? Yeah. 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 I remember I was like, why does this guy want to go on coffee? Like, like it's cool. Like I wanted to, right? But it's just not something that everybody does. It's not that often. Yeah. You need at least a couple more interactions before you get to like that. Less, coffee stage yeah just like let's go and like just talk about stuff you know yeah i mean it's i feel fairly confident in my ability to to call someone's bullshit if i can sit down and coffee with them mm. have coffee with them right so like the number of people i've had coffee with them i walk out of coffee and i'm like there's no way i'm doing business with that person mm. like i don't i don't believe the same thing same things they do i don't believe in the way they do business i don't i can't not that I can't get anything from them or provide anything to them, but it's not something I want to like hook my wagon to. So if we can get drilled down to three things, you will say that you're really big on networking, talking to people. Yes. Right. You have been promoting yourself your entire life because you talk to everyone. Yeah, it sounds, yes. The promoting I've struggled with because I, I don't want to be like the, Hey guys, look at me. Mm. And that's like, I struggle with that. Although I look back and I almost feel obligated to do it because of the lack of other people there are to look at or to watch and pay attention to. Cause I consume a lot of content and I'm like, well, dang, if they can, can, if they can produce content and get followings and people, you know, really love their content, I feel pretty confident in my experience of providing that, that level of service or content or better. So it's almost an obligation. Like, and then I also see the path of that, uh, like branding. It's personal branding, right? right. So if, if I can build that personal brand, and I also follow Gary Vee, right? And so one of his big things is, you know, build your personal brand. And whether you're in real estate or you go into insurance sales or you go into used car sales, it like, doesn't matter because it's you that they're buying from. It's not actually the, the product. Right. Because you're not selling anything. Like as a real estate agent, I'm not... S I'm not selling a house. I'm helping you find the house that you want. Not like I'm trying to talk you into 123 Main Street. That's one of the things that has really, really gotten me more interested into this. Because at the end of the day, you're helping people. Yeah. One way or another. You know, I was looking into like, okay, should I go and sell cars? They say it's a lot of money. But at the end of the day, like, you're really just working for the commission and you want them to buy your cars and you want them to buy that car. They don't really have a free will. You want to keep them on your lot. Right. I mean, which it's fair, still not as fair as I would consider agents and the, the ability that you, you can work with me if you want. Yeah. And you, the argument, yeah, we can get into that. What, what's like the argument? The, the fact that agents have like a controlling, fa like not a controlling factor. There is a, hierarchy of if you're an agent you can sell houses if you're not an agent it's not legal for you to do what agents do and transact right like, i'm a, i'm not pro-government at all so like i personally don't love that there is a basically a, a bar that you have to meet in order to do this thing but part of the deal for now <laughs> Well, that's also regulation. So you struggle with regulations. I, struggle a lot with I have I have seen a lot of YouTube videos in which you struggle with regulations. Yes. I just feel like I, I my answer to that or my reasoning is I feel like the market is smart enough to weed out the bad actors. And if you're not smart enough to weed them out as a consumer, you deserve to get burned and then you will learn the next time. And if you don't learn, you'll can continue to get burned right and like you, you will no longer be a, an active player in whatever market that is yeah i guess that's about right and so like the, like reviews like if you can get non-anonymous so i want to like a review by somebody who has done business if you could if you could do that with every single realtor right every realtor that had a bad a bad transaction if the buyer would actually or the seller would actually go leave a review on Google about what went wrong, that would be fantastic. Same with used car sales. Could you leave a review for that? Like, it's that social 
social network of like to a point if everything was videotaped right you would t you could tell who were the losers and who were the winners that's, that's like the deep. truth <laughs> the truth would tell like gary v yeah. says it and like i don't want the government in my you know business videotaping everything that i do but like to a point of that 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 would be the truth you would know who's telling the truth so that's fair that's my that's fair because i do see a lot of people that if you don't evolve you will burn yeah you will you were really burned. That brings me, again, to I really want to do a deep dive into the cities. And I want to know how you describe those cities in your personal bubble. So, like, based on what you've done. Because you only work on the De Des Moines Moines Metro, Metro yep. right? West Des Moines, Waukee, Ankeny. Yeah, like a 25-mile radius would probably be, right. like, the best explanation. Could you give me a brief description of what's going on with each city? There's like 16 of them, so I'm not going to do no, each we're, one. We're just going to do the main ones. Okay. Just what, what do you consider the main ones? All right. I consider the main ones. Let's start with Des Moines. Okay. Des Moines proper. Yes. So, and I'll, I'm going to talk about all of them at the same time of talking about Des Moines because you have to compare to something, yeah. right? There's no way to just say, these are the things about Des Moines because, like, you can spit facts, but is that that different than West Des Moines and why is it different, right? So within Des Moines, Des Moines proper is the biggest city in the state of Iowa, right? Like 250,000 people and price points, the widest spectrum of price points, meaning you have a properties that all sell for $70,000 and need complete rehab. And you, there's multi-million dollar mansions south of Grand that are all Des Moines proper, right? And they could be less than two minute drive away from each other. So when someone's looking to buy or invest in Des Moines, you have to narrow it down further than Des Moines, even further than just a zip code, because there is a, such a wide spectrum of properties between the high and low end of Des Moines, right? Now, all of your, not all, a majority of your activities, nightlife stuff is gonna be Des Moines proper, and then a couple pockets in some of the suburbs. Waukee has some pockets and Ankeny has some pockets. And like, depending on what you want to do with your day-to-day -day life or where you work or what you want for your commute, Des Moines might be perfect. So right? what, do you, what do you think um, the future holds for Des Moines as a um, city planning? It seems, um, you have, again, you have to compare to, I'm going to go, not just Des Moines versus West Des Moines or Des Moines mm -hmm. versus Waukee. It's going to be more like Des Moines versus Kansas City or Omaha okay. or, or Minneapolis. It seems after talking with people that are familiar with any of the other cities in the Midwest that are like up and so not up and coming, but like your Kansas City or Omaha, Des Moines seems like it has its shit together better than the rest of them. Meaning they don't have, they're high taxes, but it's not that crazy. There's stuff going on. There's not too much regulation there's enough regulation to make sure that you aren't putting, you know, a type of property in an area that's going to deter the values of the rest of the properties. Um, they, they seem like they have a good plan. They're growing. There's skyscrapers in the air. Whenever there's skyscra skyscrapers in the air, that means the city's doing pretty well because big companies, like it's the Starbucks method. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. So I have. You want to buy near a new Starbucks because yeah. Starbucks has already done their research. Yeah. So same thing in Des Moines. Des Moines has skyscrapers going, not skyscrapers, but like big apartment complexes, high end apartment complexes going up. And if that's the case, like the big companies have already done the research. Des Moines is established enough to handle that. So yeah, I mean, if you want to invest here, invest here. If you want to live here, you can find something that makes you happy here. Then why would I go to West Des Moines? So West Des Moines is going to have a different, like, it's going to have newer houses. It's going to have a bigger footprint of houses. You have different, le like, nicer sidewalks, like, as, as dumb as that sounds. Like, they they planned it after, basically, I don't even know when, probably the mid-century, right? They planned for what West Des Moines wanted to be. And so you can see the roads are um, planned better. Where Des Moines proper, you have skinny sidewalks, roads are... I don't want to say they're crappy, but they're not nearly as nice as West Des Moines. They've been around for 50 more years. So 
like why would you want to be in West Des Moines? Um, it's a suburbs. You're going to have a higher median income of neighbors. Like there's no arguing that your West Des Moines is going to have a higher, well, depending on the neighborhood, right? So Valley Junction's median income is going to be lower, which Valley Junction is West Des Moines. It's going to have a lower median income than South of Grand and South of Grand is Des Moines proper, but like that's a neighborhood versus another neighborhood. It's not really West Des Moines in whole versus Des Moines in whole. So why would you want to move to West Des Moines? I don't know. Yeah, no. I mean, there's no, like, I can't, it's you and your personal feeling, like your past experiences. Right. Like, that's the best answer. Like you, it's a feeling thing. So for outsiders, just from a merely s standpoint um, that an investor will have, like I'm from Kansas city. I want to invest in the morning. Like, what what goes through your head when somebody comes to you and says that? What are you trying to buy? Right. That okay. you can't, yeah. what, what are you trying to buy here that you can't buy there? So every time an investor calls me and I work with a fair amount of out-of-state investors, I ask them, why Des Moines? Like, I want to try to talk them out of Des Moines, not because I'm like trying to protect Des Moines, but I want to make sure that they're really committed to Des Moines and they've actually done the research that Des Moines is their place. Like they've, they've seen the, job growth, the incomes, the property values. If you call me and you haven't done any of that research, I'm probably not going to have a long conversation with you because you haven't done your homework. What's why Des Moines versus Cleveland, Ohio or Columbus, Ohio or Atlanta, Georgia, or like why, why, right. what can't you get there that you can get here? And it might be just the Des Moines economics. We don't go up too high. We don't go down too high. I get that. It's very is stable. Mid, is that a midways no. trend? No. No. It's just No, because they're like still in Kansas City, and I'm not not from per, uh, personal experience, but I've talked to multiple investors. There are blocks of like war zone areas that the houses are, you could buy for five thousand dollars a piece. And I'm like, why like why doesn't everyone just buy them? They're like, they're so bad and it's so crime ridden. Like you wouldn't do that as an investor unless you could hands like boots on ground handle it. Des Moines doesn't have that. The, the number of properties that sold for less than $50,000 last year has to be under a couple dozen. Like, and it like, just doesn't have those zones, those areas that are so ran down. That's what drives people in, you think? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of the things. It's also a price point. You can buy a duplex for two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand dollars $250,000. And, I mean, you ran out both sides for 1000 up to $1,200 or $1,200. A month like those numbers aren't really good but they work for some investors and that's a i mean if you tell someone they could buy a duplex that lives in denver for two hundred fifty thousand dollars, they'd ask you well, would i have to put another three hundred thousand dollars of renovations into it that's i don't know how to describe this but i feel like des moines is the place to go it's a feeling, right? It's a feeling because yeah. I, I don't see any bad news of Des Moines in comparison. In comparison. Yep. If Chicago, Des Moines, ooh, yep. like I have been in Chicago. I hate it. Yeah. And I don't know if I'm allowed to say this. I just, well, that's just personal opinion, right? Yeah. I don't like it. Yeah. It's just the houses are bricks. Yep. Over here, we have so many different types of condos but hometowns. you can get those types of houses that just isn't an entire neighborhood right in des moines yeah like it's possible right i it i don't know man i i agree i love des moines um if i didn't want farm animals and and to grow our own meat right out in the country I, we would live in the core of des moines i lived in the core of des moines for 10 years so like i've done it i lived it i saw it grow i love it I'm biased because I sell real estate here, but I still love it. Yeah, that 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 is definitely bias. Any call of action that you would like to do to any investors that might be watching this video? How can they reach out to you? How can they get in contact with you to further um, expand their knowledge on what you do and maybe get some help? Yeah, so one of the one of the main lead gen or call to actions I always do is you can schedule 30 minutes on my calendar. So go to my YouTube channel, Darson Grantham. And at the bottom of every, in the body of, of the video, it just says uh, calendarly link and you can click on it and schedule time on my personal calendar. So I had two, 
to date have not canceled anyone and said, no, I won't schedule a meeting with you. So and jump on 30 minutes and we'll talk about Des Moines, real estate investing, strategic, however you want to do it. Well, do your research before, um, before you talk to him or before you reserve your spot because he's not going to talk to you unless you've done your research and you really know what you want. No, I'll reserve it. He, I just won't, I just won't continue it. it. He has said it. He will not talk to you unless you've done your research. So, <laughs> okay, that sounds a little strict, but that, <laughs> that sums up the first chapter of Invest Iowa. Um, I hope you find all this information valuable and I, and I hope at least one thing sticks into your brain and then you can carry on and then have further conversations with people in this field reach out if you have any questions if you have any suggestions or comments we would love to hear from you and if you have any questions um, i will give them to our darson and maybe have another uh, interview just so we can answer some of the questions that people want to hear right and without any more hesitation i'll see you guys in the next episode and subscribe hit the like button it really helps us and yeah that's it stay safe <laughs>